The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But they should. Views expressed in this program don't reflect the views of a lot of people, but they should. Friends, we're glad that you are here, and we hope that when we're done tonight, <clears throat> that maybe the views expressed from God's Word, which is what we're going to be studying tonight, will be the same views that you have. So, welcome to Word of the Lord. James over here with you, and we always are glad for you to contact us. I um, was just on the phone with a gentleman from Canada who is... Uh, uh, going to be watching tonight. Hopefully he's, he's found the link and we're uh, up and running for him to, to see. But uh, anyway, so a lot of people are, are watching and uh, um, studying God's Word. They are appreciating, I believe, the, the, uh, the plainness with which we speak. We're not trying to sugarcoat anything. We're not trying to uh, win friends and influence people except to win friends to God and influence them with the Word of God. That's all we're trying to do. And so, friends, we appreciate you watching. And if you'd like to reach me, you can reach me at 276-340-2653. Like the gentleman, uh, Wayne, from uh, Canada just called and, and said that. Or wordmanlord at gmail.com if you want to email me. Be glad to hear from you uh, in that way as well. Tonight, we're going to start off. We're just going to start off with, this is kind of a, uh, it's not real long, but it's a several-minute uh, clip of a video of a caller that called in uh, a few weeks ago, he made a, he made a comment, and uh, we want to uh, basically let this be the springboard for our lesson tonight. So I'm going to let you listen to this. Now, let me just say at the out outset, I'm not, when, when I play videos like this uh, gentleman here, uh, I don't want you to think that every time you call in that we're going to use this as, a, as a, that I'm going to use this as a, uh, a teaching program, but it might, But if, because if the question's good, Maybe someone had the same question, and then we get to uh, uh, maybe uh, what go into a little more detail and uh, divulge a little bit more into uh, uh, what the uh, answer really is. Uh, if it's a, if it's a topic that really you know maybe it was off topic what we're talking about, and so I said, well, we'll talk about it later. So uh, I'm not trying to uh, bash this man or at anything, but I thought it was a good question, a good statement. Uh, and so uh, it may have some information. Maybe you thought the same thing. And so we're going to let you listen to this program, listen to this uh, call, and then we'll go into the lesson. Okay, what about the fact that God, uh, okay, he said if your left hand offend thee, cut it off. Okay. That, so in other words, what he's telling me is uh, I don't need these body parts. No, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's what not saying cut it? off your what hand. What was he saying? He's not saying cut off his hand. He's saying it ought to be the case that whatever is offending you ought to be what you move out of your life. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. He's not saying poke your eye out. He's saying stop looking at whatever's caused you to sin. Then why did he say pluck it out? It's a figure of speech, sir. Oh, oh so conveniently you could say, well, this is exactly what the Bible says. But, sir. oh, he, this is a figure of speech. Sir, do you, did your, has your hand ever offended it you? Be a figure of speech. Has your hand ever offended you? Has your eye ever I'm offended you? Have, has your eye ever caused you to sin? I, hey, that's what he said. Well, have, has your eye ever caused you to sin? Have you ever seen something what? that you shouldn't have seen? Looked at it and lusted after it? Yes. Did you pluck your eye out? No, because then I'm why too didn't weak. You why did you disobey Jesus then? Well, I mean, why, why, why didn't Jesus explain it in that fashion? Why, why, is, it, why is it that uh, you, you literally you know, take certain things Jesus, out of the Bible? Jesus spake then, in parables. Jesus certain, spake in parables. Things, you say, well, oh, he, meant, sir, he didn't mean it that way. Sir, Jesus spake a lot in parables so that the people who were looking for the truth would find them and those that didn't wouldn't find them. And maybe you're one of the ones that's not really looking. <clears throat> All right. God, God uses figures of speech in the Bible just like you and I use figures of speech. Oh, because okay. we talk, so, we, we, but, but only certain ones can can de can determine sir, figures of speech. There, sir, when you're talking about interpreting the Bible, it has to be in agreement with the rest of the Bible. Jesus would not say, "Cut your hand off," and literally mean, "Cut your hand off." Haven't you ever used okay. a, heard the saying, cut off your nose in spite of your face? Well, you don't really cut your nose off. 
That's that's a man. A man man said that. Okay. okay. God said um, in uh, several instances in the um, in the Old Testament when I was reading it, he was saying that certain things that uh, certain statutes or uh, that you do, such as uh, a man sleeping with another man's wife, he said, kill him, take him out and stone him. Did right. he mean for, for them to kill him? Oh, yeah. He okay, did. well, if he, okay, he will kill you, but he won't cut your hand off. He said for you to cut your hand off. Why didn't you do it? If you believe that's what he meant, why didn't you do it? Because I was too weak. Well... See, sir, this, hey, how many how many people? How many people? So God's telling you to do something that you can't do. No one people are so weak you can't put their eyes. They can cut up their hand. No, f sir. You know what? We need a whole lesson on hermeneutics, on how to interpret the Bible. And that's really what we're going to have to talk about. Listen, I, let me let me get back I, on my lesson. Let me get back on my lesson. I, All right. So I need to get back on my lesson. But I said, you know what? We need a whole lesson on hermeneutics. So that's what we're going to do tonight, friends. There's when understanding the Bible, there's a lot that you need to realize to really simplify understanding the Bible. God did not write a book that we cannot understand. I mean, think about it for a moment. Friends, you think about God is giving us a book. God is talking to us through this book. Uh, when you're reading the Bible, you're reading what God has to say. Now, let's just look at this for a moment. In Matthew chapter 22... I have to get my Bible program up here so we can read together. But in Matthew chapter 22 and uh, verse 31, Jesus is talking to uh, individuals about the resurrection. They've asked him a question about the resurrection. And listen to what Jesus says. He says, but as touching the resurrection, or in concerning the resurrection, as touching the resurrection, have you not read, now listen, have you not read, that which was spoken unto you, somebody spoke something, but yet they were reading it. So have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So Jesus expected them to understand that when they were reading the Bible, God was speaking to them from what was written. God said it, but it was written down. Now, friends, that's exactly how we use the Bible today. When you read the Bible, and I just talked about this tonight in class uh, in, uh, on the boulevard where we're studying uh, Thessalonians, and so uh, I made this uh, point. I said, you know, when you're reading the Bible, you ought to read the Bible not as if you're reading it, not as if it's your words or Paul's words. Read it as if God is speaking to you because that's exactly what it is. And that's what Paul said to the Thessalonians. He said, you received the word, not as man's words, but as it were in truth, the word of God. And so when you're reading the Bible, friends, that's God talking to us. So when we're reading the Bible, we should know that God is talking to us in a way that we can understand. He's going to talk to us in ways that we would communicate. And that means sometimes he's going to use different kinds of language to speak to us. And by different kinds of language, I'm talking about figures of speech, the way we talk, the way we use things, metaphors and similes and things like that. That's what we're talking about. That's how God talks to us because that's how we talk. That's how we talk to each other. I mean, we talk to each other all the time and we use, we use words and phrases that... <clears throat> uh, that are not literal, but yet we understand the meaning. Now, listen, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, the Bible says that God spake unto Moses as a friend speaketh to a friend. Well, don't you think God is going to talk to us the same way? He's not going to communicate to us in such a way that we can't understand him. Now, I know there's some people who would say, well, you can't understand the Bible unless the Holy Spirit guides you and moves you and enlightens you and, and, and uh, uh, illuminates you to understand the Bible. Well, friends, why did God even write it if the Holy Spirit has to illuminate it? God wrote the Bible so that we can understand it, so that we can know His will. Look in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 17. Ephesians 5 and verse 17. Paul said, Wherefore, be not 
uh, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. How do you understand what the will of the Lord is if you can't understand the Bible, if you can't understand God talking to us? How can you understand what God's will is if you can't understand him talking? But then again, Paul said in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, friends, your mind is where you get understanding. Now, if you can't understand the Word of God, if you can't understand the will of God, you can understand God talking to you, if you can't understand God talking to you, how in the world is your mind going to be renewed? And then, how are you going to be able to understand what His will is in order to renew your mind? So it comes down to how do we know what God is saying? Well, God is going to talk to us like a friend speaks to a friend. He's going to talk to us as friends would. And he was, he's going to use, then he's going to use language like we would use. Listen, when we talk about the Bible, oftentimes you hear talk about context. You look at the, at the context of the verse, and that helps you understand the meaning. You know, we hear politicians all the time, uh, uh, you know, they whine and complain, well, someone took me out of context. Someone took me out of context. I didn't really mean it that way. I didn't really say that. They took me out of context. Well, what about the Bible? People take the Bible out of context all the time, and then they wonder, why does God tell me to do this, or why did God tell me to do that, or why did God say that, when they don't even understand what God was saying because they took it out of context. They didn't understand the context in which he, is, he was speaking. And so we should realize that God is going to use language like figurative and literal uh, uh, phrases of expression to get across his meaning. Now, when I say figurative language, I'm talking about specifically, in this case, figures of speech. God is not talking about some literal things if he's using a figure of speech. For example, Jesus said, I, and Isaiah said, Paul said, they talked about people who hardened their hearts. They hardened their hearts. Now, friends, how in the world did they harden their heart? Did they, did they open up their mind? Now, we're talking about the, the mind here, and, and really a heart in that sense is a figure of speech too. We're talking about the, the intellect here. We're not talking about the blood pumper. They hardened their heart. So they're not talking about cholesterol buildup. We're talking about the hardening of your mind, your intellect, the seed of your reasoning. How does a man harden his heart? How, how do you do that? Do you open up your mind and pour liquid nitrogen on it? Boy, that'd harden it all right. That'd freeze it. Not, no, that's not how they hardened it. What, did it dry out, put it out in the sun, bake it? Well, I think some people have been out in the sun too long, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about hardening their hearts. See, it's a figure of speech. You've got... You've got uh, 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 hard hearts and you've got uh, deaf ears. You've got eyes that see, but yet they can't see. What is that? It's a figure of speech. It's, it's, it's language that is painting a picture for us. And so, friends, if we don't understand that God is going to use the same kind of language we use, then we're really not going to understand his will. We're really not going to be able to understand his, uh, the Bible from us. Now, friends, we use figures of speech all the time. Did you catch that? We use figures of speech all the time. Well, we don't use them all the time. That in itself is a figure of speech. See? And so you have to realize common sense is going to tell you that, well, James, he was using a, a figure of speech. He was using a hyperbole maybe. You know, here it is, an exaggeration. That's what we're talking about. We're using something to show that, well, we use it a lot. Now, uh, you know, why would we be surprised then when the Bible uses that? Now, see, we use figures of speech to, to describe something, to tell you something. You know, like, like uh, Blake might be over there. He might say, I'm so hungry, I can eat a horse. Well, I don't think he's really going to eat a horse. And even if he decided he wanted to eat a horse, I don't think he'd eat a whole horse. He probably couldn't even, even, eat, a, even eat a Shetland pony. See? But that, that's, that's a figure of speech, See? 
That's a figure of speech. Sometimes I, sometimes uh, I, I call my daughters. They get up in the morning. And they're all grumpy. I call them grouchy bears. Well, they're really not bears. But it's a, they call them grouchy bears. Why? Well, because they're grumbling. They're, you know, sleepy, grumbly. But I'm calling them a bear. That's right, friends. That's a figure of speech. Actually called a metaphor. See? So we're talking about when God talks to us, he's going to use that kind of language because we get it. See, we can understand that language. Now, so the key, the key is uh, determining the difference. When is God using a figure of speech and when is he using something literal that he literally wants you to do this? Well, let's look at some things. Let's look at some things. Listen, here's some rules, friends. And this is just common sense, really, when he gets right down to it. And common sense is a big rule that some people just seem to throw out the window when it comes to understanding the Bible. I always say that when it comes, there's two things in life when people just throw out common sense. When it, when it comes to love, being in love, and reading the Bible, everything just uh, have no idea what they're going to do. Well, listen, friends, when you're reading the Bible, you say, well, is this literal or is this figurative? Well, listen, friends, it's figurative when the literal is impossible to do. If the Bible says something and it is impossible for it to be done, then it's probably figurative. For example, look at this. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 22. Matthew 8 and verse 22. Now I'm talking, to the, I'm, I'm talking about this because the caller <clears throat> that called in a few weeks ago he expressed something that I think probably a lot of people have never even thought of. But look at this, friends. In Matthew 8, 22, Jesus said, Jesus said unto him, a man said he's going to follow him, but he said, first, let me go and bury my father. First, let me go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Now, friends, is that, fig is that figurative language? Is that a figure of speech? Let the dead bury the dead? How, how are dead people, physically dead people, going to bury physically dead people? If dead always means literally, if it always means literally, then we're going to have trouble right here. Let the dead bury the dead? I mean, how are they going to do that? Because the literal, physical dead are not going to be able to bury anybody. They can't do anything. They can't do anything. Now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Jesus knew something. Maybe he's talking about the walking dead. I don't know. I don't think so. I know he's not. See, he's not talking about literal dead burying the dead. He's talking about a certain kind of dead people burying the physically dead. How do we know he's talking about physically dead? Because the man said, let me go bury my father. He's literally saying, let me, let me wait till my, my father dies. Let me go bury him. And then I'll follow you. Jesus said, let the dead, let the spiritually dead take care of the physical dead. How do, we know, how, we, how do we know that? Friends, look at this. Look at this. The dead can be living. Now, how can you be living when you're dead? Or how can you be dead when you're living? How can you be dead when you're living? Look at this. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. <clears throat> Paul says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now how can a person be dead while she's living? It must be that she's dead one way and living another way. She's dead spiritually while she's living physically. See, death is simply a separation. James describes physical death as when the body is separated from the spirit. And so it is when a person is spiritually dead to separate from God. That's why God told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. But they didn't die. Physically that day, they were driven out of the garden and uh, Adam lived to be what? Six, seven hundred years? I mean... So, so that so, how how is it? Well, he died, but yet he didn't die. He died spiritually. But yet, but yet, he lived. Now that's what the Bible's talking about. See, so you can determine if something is physical, or or spiritual. Dead, 
uh, and like this. Look at this. In Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, 930 years. Adam lived 930 years. All right, it was, this is the prodigal son. The father says, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. Was he dead? Was he literally dead? I don't think so. He went out there and partied and spent all his money. Was he alive then? Um, he was living it up. See that? He was, whoa, he's living it up. He was out there feeding the hogs. But he wasn't dead. He might have wished he was dead, but he wasn't dead. He comes back home and his dad says, you know what? He was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. Was he really lost? He knew exactly where he was going. He knew exactly where he was going when he left, and he knew how to get back home. He wasn't lost. He was lost in a spiritual sense. See that? So is it literal? Friends, you can't take the, everything in the Bible. Literally, you have to understand God is communicating to you just like, he would communicate, like we would communicate with one another. In order to, to get a message across, let's look at one more in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul said, and you hath he quickened, that is to made live, you hath he, hath he brought to life who were dead in trespass and sin. There it is. You were dead in trespass and sins, but now you've been made alive. Dead and made alive. Come down to verse 5. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together in Christ, with Christ, by grace are you saved. Dead, made alive. Spiritually dead, made alive spiritually. Now, friends, you see how, how simple it is? When you look at the Bible and you use common sense, when you say, well, you know what? It's impossible for that to be literal. It must be figurative. It must be a figure of speech, something like that. So that's one rule. That's, that's one simple rule. Now, doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that help? Now, what about this? <clears throat> if the definite is put for the indefinite. Now, that's what we talked about a while ago, all the time, you know. Hey, we use this all the time. Sometimes the Bible puts a definite number for an indefinite. Because we can't comprehend some things, but if you put a definite number on it, then we can comprehend that. Friends, I can't comprehend, I can't comprehend how far it is from here to the sun. I, I can see the sun in the sky, you know. But to comprehend 93, was it 93 million miles? 93 million miles? I have no idea how long far that is. See that? But I know how far it is from here to Texas. <laughs> I know how far it is from here to California. See that? I can look at a map and see how far it is around the world. And so then I can start to comprehend something. But the Bible sometimes puts a definite for an indefinite because God knows that our minds can't comprehend things because we are, we're, we are a, a finite beings. In other words, we have, a, we have an end here. And so the Bible does that sometimes. The Bible does that sometimes. For example, in Genesis 31.10, 31.7, Genesis 31 and verse 7, uh, Jacob says to Laban, he says, you've changed my wages 10 times. Well, I don't know if you changed it 10 times or not. Literally 10 times, right? But we do that all the time. So I've told you a thousand times. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Well, that's a definite. Put for an indefinite because I don't know how many times I've told you, but yet it's a lot, all right? Here's another one. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Friends, that's a figure of speech. It doesn't say that one day is with the Lord, one day is a thousand years with the Lord. It says one day is as a thousand years. How long is a thousand years? I don't know. I've never lived it. And I never will. So how can, how can we comprehend that? Well, we're just showing that our time frame and God's time frame 
are so different. So there's figures of speech. Well, someone sees this, like, well, there's a thousand years, yeah. One day with the Lord is like is a thousand years. No, it's not a thousand years. It's as a thousand years. Now, see how simple that is? Now, you'll get a lot of things mixed up and confused if you don't understand little things like this little word right here, as. As. That's a simile. All right, now, so, uh, anytime. So, numbers, you know, when numbers are used, when, when, uh, when numbers are used to express emphasis, you know, they, they should be considered figurative. Just like we talked about a thousand times, all right? So, indefinite for, for uh, indefinite. Let me, let's use one more. Let's get down to some, to some uh, true uh, teaching uh, elements here. Look at this. Friends, it is figurative language when evil is commanded and good is forbidden. Now, now stay with me on that. When evil is commanded and good is forbidden, then it's figurative language. Don't take that literally. For example, let's look at this. Luke 14, verse 26. Luke 14 and verse 26. Jesus said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own uh, life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, all these people here claim to be disciples of Christ. They, they, oh, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Do you hate your mama? Oh, no, I love my mama. No. No. You got to hate her. Got to hate her. Hate your mama. Hate your daddy. Hate your brothers and sisters. Hate your wife. Hate your children. What? You mean the Bible's telling me I have to hate somebody? I thought God was love. God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8. So how is it? How is it that I'm supposed to do this? How, how am I going to be a disciple of Christ and love everybody, but yet at the same time I've got to hate somebody to be a disciple of Christ? You've got to hate somebody to be a disciple of Christ to show that you love everybody because you're a disciple of Christ. Does that make sense? In order to be a disciple of Christ and love everybody, you've got to hate everybody. Friends, that, that's figurative language. You have to understand, Jesus can't really mean, literally, hate your father, your mother, sister, brother, wife, and children. So what does that mean? Well, the idea is, found when you look at the Bible. Listen, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2, verses, uh, verses 1 and 2, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise. Now, how am I going to honor my father and mother while at the same time hating them? It's figurative, friends. In other words, what Jesus is saying in Luke 14, 26, let's get back here to look at it. What Jesus is saying is, compared to your love for me, compared to your love for following me and obeying me and doing my will, your love has to be so great that compared to my love for me, you're going to hate your parents. You're going to hate your wife and your kids. Love me first is what he's saying. He's not saying hate them. He's, he's, he's pointing out, compared, compared to your love for me, it's going to be like you hate them. Now, friends, listen, we use that same kind of language. You know, we use that same kind of language. You know, you might, you might say, you might say, well, you know what, that, uh, uh, that odor was, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> she was so pretty, you know, she could make a rose look ugly. See how that works? 
we're saying something is so great compared to something else that, you know, the, the thing that's most beautiful even looks ugly comparatively. And so compared to the love you have for Christ, your love for your father, mother, sister, brother, hu uh, husband, wife, spouse, whatever, is going to be like hate. So when you're reading the Bible, you say, well, God literally wants me to hate somebody? No, he doesn't. He wants you to understand figurative language. Now, remember this. It's evil. It's evil when, uh, or it's when evil is co commanded and good is forbidden, then it has to be figurative language. Now, let's get back to what our caller said. Let's play one uh, little clip from, from our caller again. Okay, what about the fact that God, uh, okay, he said if your left hand offend thee, cut it off. Okay. So in other words, what he's telling me is, uh, I don't need these body parts. No, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's what not he saying cut it? off your hand. What was he saying? He's not saying cut off your hand. He's saying it ought to be the case that whatever is offending you ought to be what you move out of your life. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. He's not saying poke your eye out. He's saying stop looking at whatever's causing you to sin. Then why did he say pluck it out? It's a figure of speech, sir. Oh, oh, so conveniently you could say, well, this is exactly what the Bible says. But, sir. oh, he, this is a figure of speech. Sir, you, Why is it that uh, you, you literally you take certain things Jesus, out of the Bible? Jesus spake then, in parables. Jesus certain, spake in certain parables. Things, you say, well, oh, he, meant, sir, he didn't mean it that way. Sir, Jesus spake a lot in parables so that the people who were looking for the truth would find them and those that didn't wouldn't find them. And maybe you're one of the ones that's not really looking. Okay, now listen. He he specifically asked about cutting off your hand that offends you. So let's just go to that verse. Let's go to that verse. Matthew chapter 18, 8 and 9. Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9. All right. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. And cast them from thee, it is better for thee to enter into, the, uh, into life uh, halt or maimed rather than having two hands, read this, than having two hands or feet and be cast into and be cast to everlasting fire. All right? Now, why would he say that? Why would Jesus say that? If your hand offends you, cut it off. Why would he say that? Because, friends, he's stressing how important it is. Ooh, what did we just do here? We just got rid of be big. All right. Uh, can you put that back? He's stressing how important it is to make sure that you make it into the next life. In other words, anything that's keeping you from entering into eternal life you need to put, get rid of. You need to cut it out of your life. Now, you say, well, how do we know that? How do we know that's, that's, that's figurative? How do we know that's figurative language? Well, let's look, at, let's look at one more here. Here's the Bible answer. The Bible answer is in Colossians 3 and verse 5. Colossians 3 verse 5. See, the Bible is its own best commentary. Paul says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Now that word mortify means to put to death. Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. What are you going to do with it? For which things sake the wrath of God uh, cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which ye were also, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. When you mortify your members, when you put to death your members, you're putting off the old man with his deeds. 
See, friends, that's what it means to put it to death. When you cut off your hand, you're cutting off the old man. You're cutting off the things that are going to hinder you from entering into eternal life. And so God would not command you to do something. He wouldn't command you to do something that was evil and then turn around and say, well, that's the way you enter into life. You don't sin so that you can uh, get to heaven, right? You get rid of sin. You put off the old man and his deeds. So that doesn't mean kill yourself. It means kill the deeds that are done by the body. My friends, only you have control of your body. Only you can put to death that old man. I mean, think about it. You put to death the old man of sin when you die to sin. When you die to sin. When you're buried with Christ, you die to sin. Let's look at one. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Wait, you're dead? Liter you're literally dead? No. You're dead to sin. You're spiritually dead. Literally, you're alive. Literally, you're alive. But spiritually, you're dead to sin. How could you live longer there, any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us as were, as, <clears throat> as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, wait a minute. We died with Christ? Literally we died with Christ? No, friends. Spiritually we did. It's a matter of speaking. Spiritually we die with Christ. We're buried with him. And now, when you're raised from the waters of baptism, raised up from the dead, spiritually dead, now you're raised from the spiritual dead, now you're living, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. How do you get a new life? How do you put to death and get a new life and never die? Simple. You die spiritually and you're raised up to a new spiritual life. And you never died physically. It's spiritual. All right? Figurative, figuratively speaking here. And so he says, For this we have been, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our, uh, that our, that our old man is crucified. Killed your whole body there, didn't you? You didn't just cut off your hand and your feet. You, you, killed, you killed your whole body. Now, friends, does that mean that you really crucify yourself? Did you, get, did you, get, did you uh, nail yourself to the cross? Did you really crucify yourself? Listen, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole lot uh, uh, stronger uh, what act of, than just cutting off your hand. Isn't it? Cutting off your hand or cutting off your foot? You can live without, without your hand and your foot, but you can't live if you kill yourself. But Paul says we have been crucified. We crucified our old man. It's the same idea that he's talking about in Colossians 3, 5 when he says mortify your members and put to death those members, put to death the things that are done with those members because you've killed the old man, you put off the old man in the sins, now you've crucified the old man in the sins, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth you should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now friends, that's not literal. That's not a literal death. I think we all understand that's figurative, right? So when, when God, or when the Bible, well, when God, when God's talking to us through his word, and he says do something that seems to be evil, 
or he commands something that is, um, uh, he forbids good and commands evil, that he must be telling us something. He must be painting us a picture of something. He didn't want us to kill ourselves. He didn't want us to cut off our hands and our feet. He's wanting us to put to death the old man of sin that's ruling our lives so that we can have a new life. And individuals who have been <clears throat> obedient to the gospel, who have believed that Jesus is the Son of God, who have repented their sins, who have confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and uh, uh, have been baptized, they have been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ. And then raised, just as God raised Christ from the dead, God raises that person from the watery grave of baptism to be a new creature. The same power that brought Christ up from the grave is the same power that brings a person up a new creature in Christ. Then someone says, well, baptism don't have anything to do with salvation. Well, I didn't write the book. But God says you die in baptism and you're raised a new creature by the same power that brought Christ from the dead. Now you can say baptism doesn't have anything to do with salvation if you want to. But my Bible says it's when I come up out of the waters of baptism, having been obedient to Christ, that's when I'm a new creature. Now you won't understand that. You won't get that if you're looking at everything as being literal. Friends, God is not commanding us to do something that's evil or forbidding us to do something good unless it's using a figure of speech. Let me, let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. Who wants to drink some blood? Who wants to eat some flesh? Now, friends, I'm not accountable. I, I don't ever, I, I don't ever want to even think about eating somebody else. That's, that's, that's terrible. But you know what? That's what Jesus says. Yeah, see, if you don't understand the difference between the literal and physical, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to turn into a cannibal. If you become a Christian, you're going to become a cannibal. If you don't understand how the Bible talks, let me show you. In Matthew, Matthew 26, look at this. Matthew 26, verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed it, and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Uh, wait a minute, Jesus, that looks like bread. That looks like unleavened bread. Nope, that's my body. Wait, wait a minute. I'm eating your flesh? No. The bread represents his body. Is that figurative or literal? Friends, if you say that's literal, you're going to have trouble. All right, we've got some phone calls here. You want to work from the Lord? James, you got it out before I got you on the phone. But I was going to say, what about the Lord's Supper, the people uh, eating the flesh and drinking of his blood? I, you know, it makes you wonder how people make it through this world nowadays without any common sense. <laughs> they, they need to right. start reading the Word and thinking and and acting upon it before they just jump to conclusions and everything. Right. Just If it doesn't make sense, stop and ask yourself, you know, stop and ask some questions here. You know, what am I missing? That's what that's what people need to do. That's the first thing they teach them in uh, preschool, I guess, or any other grade. Like, that, that, if it doesn't make sense to it, look back at it and, and read over it and think about it instead of right. acting upon it. That's right. That's right. All right. Take well, program, glad we're on the same page. All right. Thanks for your call. All right. So we're on the same page. That's good. So Jesus said, take heed, this is my body. This is my body. And then look what it says in verse 27. He said, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. <clears throat> For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the mystery of sins. So eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now friends, if you don't understand figurative language, figurative speech, then you're going to have trouble. I mean, you're going to start believing a false doctrine. As a matter of fact, the Catholics, they, believe, they actually believe that the, that the unleavened bread 
and the, and the, and the fruit of the vine actually turns into the flesh and blood. That makes me, that makes me just, ugh, just get queasy just thinking about it. Now, think about that, friends. Jesus is not saying that's literally his body and literally his blood. It's representative of it. This is my body and this is my blood. See that? So, friends, that, that's what we're talking about. If you don't understand, if you don't understand the, the difference, then you're going to have some trouble here. Look at first, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Second Samuel uh, 23 and verse 17. Second Samuel 23, 17. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, David. David was running from Saul. Now look at this. David was then in a hold and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? He's talking about the water. Is the water not the blood of these men? Well, I hope it's not their, their blood. And so what did he do? And therefore he poured it out and would not drink it. But he said the water was their blood. Well, it wasn't. He's just saying that they put their lives at risk. They risked shedding their blood to get that water. That's how precious it was. And so you see this? You see what we're talking about, friends? If you don't understand that God is speaking to us in language like we use with one another to help understand his will, then you're never really going to understand the will of God. You're going to have trouble understanding it, okay? So if something is, if God commands wickedness or evil and he forbids doing good, <coughs> then it's probably figurative. He's probably trying to get you to see how important something is. All right? So don't go chopping off your fingers. Don't go chopping off your toes or your feet. Look, don't go plucking out your eye. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Stop looking at whatever you're looking at. If, if you've got a problem stealing, don't cut your hand off. Now, in some countries, they will. Just stop stealing. Ephesians 4, verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him work, laboring with his hands, the thing which is good, that he might have that, that he might have to give to them that are in need. All right? Put your hands to use for something that's good. All right? All right, so you misunderstand it. Let's look at one more here. Figurative language. Friends, it's figurative language. It's figurative language when the literal contradicts another passage. All right? When the literal contradicts something else, friends, you've you got to say, all right, th that's got to be figurative language. Now, you need to remember, in all cases, the sum of God's word is truth. In other words, it can't contradict. The, the scriptures cannot be broken. Now, Listen, the Bible talks about God having eyes. Zechariah 4 and verse 10 says the eyes of the Lord. Uh, I'm going to have to hurry here because I'm getting, a, I'm, I see I'm running out of time here. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the uh, plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel with these seven. These are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now the eyes, does the Lord really have eyes? Does he have eyes like this? Listen, God is a spirit. John 4 verse 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now God is a spirit. A spirit 
does not have flesh and blood. Luke 24, verse 39. Jesus comes into their midst, and they thought that, you know, they thought that he was a ghost, and he said, Look, behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself, handle me, and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Well, if God's a spirit, how does he have eyes? And how does he have, how does he have uh, arms? And uh, look at this. How does he have arms? The arm of the Lord? The arm of the Lord? Uh, John 12, verse 38. How, how does he have an arm? If he's a spirit, the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, uh, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed the report, and who hath, to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? How does God have an arm if he's a spirit? How does he have a hand? In uh, Exodus nine and verse three, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon the cattle. Talking about the plagues that came upon the Egyptians. It was the hand of the Lord. Really? Does God really have a hand? The Bible says he does. The hand of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is ear heavy that he cannot hear. So God is said to have eyes. He's said to have a hand. He's said to have an arm. Ears. Right? He has a nose. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 8. And the blast, with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. That's how God parted the Red Seas, with his breath, with the blast of his nostrils. Does God have a nose? I thought it was a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and blood, but yet we're told he has a nose, he has eyes, he has an arm, he has a hand, he has ears, he even has a face. The face of the Lord, the face of the Lord is against them that do Evil. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayer. He's the eyes and the ears. The face of the Lord is against them to do evil. Now friends, how is it that we can reconcile the fact that the Bible says God's a spirit, therefore he does not have flesh and blood, but yet he has arm, hands, eyes, ears, nose. He has a face, he even has a mouth. If you want to get right down to it, it's what the Bible says. How are we going to harmonize that? Does he literally have eyes, ears, nose, mouth? No. Figuratively speaking, why? Because the Bible is trying to help us understand God. That's called anthropomorphism. It is making God have the attributes of a man. Now, friends, if you take everything in the Bible as literal, you're going to have trouble. Now, let me show you how this, this, this right here, has caused people problems. You know our Seventh-day Adventist friends? They come up with a doctrine that says the Ten Commandments were written by God. And the Law of Moses was written by Moses. And that's why they say, well, we don't keep all the, we don't keep all the law. You know, we don't keep all that law. That's the Law of Moses. We just keep the Ten Commandments because it's the one, because the Ten Commandments says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And that's what we keep. We just keep the Ten Commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, you know, don't bear false witness, don't commit adultery and honor thy father and mother and keep that Sabbath day. And so they come up with this idea that, well, the Ten Commandments are what God wrote, but Moses wrote the rest of it. Look at this. Exodus 31, verse 18. Exodus 31 and verse 18. And he gave it to Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. But you know what, friends? If you read Exodus 34, if you read Exodus 34 and verse 27, you know what you're going to find? Those tables of stones were written, look at this, the Lord said unto Moses, write upon these words, write upon these words, for after the tenor of the words that I have made the covenant with thee and with Israel. And he, that's Moses, was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water. Well, that has to be Moses. God doesn't need bread, doesn't need bread or drink water. 
He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Moses wrote the Ten Commandments, but it's said to be written by the finger of God. You know why? Because God was the author of it. Just like when the Egyptians were uh, being plagued, they said this is done by the finger of God. It's saying it was by the power of God. Jesus said, by the finger of God, he cast out demons. He said, I've done this work by the finger of God. Friends, that's, that's, that's figurative language. It has to be interpreted as figurative because God doesn't literally have a finger. Now, friends, we're, we've, got, we've got problems. When people don't understand, when people don't understand that... Uh, Figurative language <clears throat> is some, sometimes uh, uh, used, then they're going to have problems like this. Let me give you one, let's get one more. We have individuals that believe that baptism is. Sometimes, some situations, baptism is not available, and I think you'd still be born again. All right. That's, that's not the verse I wanted, uh, clip I wanted. There have individuals that say that when you're born again in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, they will tell us that that is the amionic fluid. That's the, the water in the womb. Nicodemus asked Jesus, or Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot See the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter again the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now we're told by people who don't understand language, Bible language, we're told that this is literally the water, the amionic fluid. And when a woman gives birth, then that's the first birth. And then the second birth is a spiritual birth. Friends, I don't know what the Bible says at all. Look, Jesus tells you exactly what it is. He says to Nicodemus, he said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except the man be born again. Nicodemus doesn't understand, so Jesus clarifies it. And this is what he says. This is what being born again means. Being born again means, except a man be born of water and the Spirit. Now, if you're born again, that means you're already born once. You're born from your mom. But being born again is being born of water and the Spirit. Now, why would Jesus say being born again means being born the first time, and being born again means being born the first time and of the Spirit? That's like three births there. No, water and the Spirit is the Spirit gave instructions on how to be baptized, how to be born of water. The waters of baptism. Now, friends, when you can't understand that, people start making this. They want to make this a, some kind of literal uh, birth water. They want to make it some kind of uh, super fantastic way of being born. No, friends, listen to what the Bible's saying. A man must be born of water and the Spirit. And that's exactly what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. The washing of water. The waters of baptism, according to the word. Someone says, well, I've been baptized. Well, have you been baptized according to the word? Oh, well, I was baptized. I, was baptized. I got saved and I was baptized. That's not according to the word. So you can't, be, you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. Now, if you don't understand how the Bible uses language, friends, you're going to mess up. You're going you're to have a big mistake here. And friends, that's why so many people don't understand the will of God is because they don't understand how God's talking to them. They don't understand his language. Even though it's plain language, even though it's plain to see, 
Plain to understand, they don't understand what his will is because they're looking at the Bible either literally or they're taking the things that God says literally and they're making them figurative. I find it amazing how many people see everything in the Bible as, as figurative, 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 and then they get to things like the thousand-year reign that's talked about in Revelation. Well, that's literal. That's a literal thousand years. Everything else in the Bible, everything else in the Bible, they, they miss. And they get to this, and they go, well, that's literal. Everything's just backwards. They want to make the things that God's saying figurative. They want to make them literal. They want to take the things that God says literally, and they want to make them figuratively. But friends, common sense will tell us, and the context will tell us. If you need help understanding the will of God, friends, we want to help you. But the Bible makes sense. The Bible makes sense. If you stop and ask yourself the right questions, is this figurative or is this literal? What is God's will for me? Friends, we're out of time. If we can help you and assist you in any way to uh, help you understand the will of God, we want to do that very thing. 276-340-2653. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.